Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. The Supreme Court has approved a proposal to introduce African cheetahs from Namibia into the Indian habitat on an experimental basis. See, the type of cheetahs that were found in the Indian subcontinent historically were the Asiatic cheetahs. The Asiatic cheetahs were spread wide across the Asian continent and historically they were found across the Arabian Peninsula in today's Iran, Iraq, Turkey, parts of Central Asia and as well as across the Indian subcontinent. But today their population has depleted drastically and they can be found naturally only in Iran. See the preferred habitat of the Asiatic cheetahs were open grasslands and semi-desert areas and historically they were found across the western, central and eastern and southern areas of the Indian subcontinent. In the west, Asiatic cheetahs were found in abundance in the semi-desert and open grassland areas of today's Rajasthan, Gujarat and Punjab. In the central and eastern parts of the subcontinent, they were found in today's Chhattisgarh and Odessa and their range extended as far as the open grasslands of today's Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu in the south. This magnificent species, which was found across western, southern and central parts of Asia, was driven towards extinction, primarily because of overhunting and captive breeding. So as a result, the Asiatic cheetahs have been declared extinct in India since 1952 and on the IUCN Red Data Book, it has been listed as critically endangered. The last confirmed presence of the Asiatic cheetahs in India was noted in 1947 when Maharaja Ramanuj Pratap Singh hunted the animal in Korea which is located in today's Chhattisgarh. It is this practice of the Royal Kingdoms of India which has driven the species towards extinction. Hunting the Asiatic cheetahs was a prized sport for various kings and emperors of the Indian subcontinent and as well as for the British officials. It is this practice of overhunting which primarily drove the species towards extinction. And some of the royals used to even capture the Asiatic cheetahs and raise them in captivity in order to be used as assistants in royal hunts while hunting deers, gazelles, etc. Studies have shown that Asiatic cheetahs do not thrive in captivity and this is also one of the primary reasons which drove the species towards extinction in India. In fact, the Asiatic cheetah is the only large mammal in India which has been driven towards extinction due to anthropogenic and unnatural causes. So after the last known Asiatic cheetah was hunted in 1947, the species was declared extinct in India in 1952. But over the last two decades, the Ministry of Environment and Forest, the Wildlife Institute of India and the National Tiger Conservation Authority have been making efforts to reintroduce the Asiatic cheetah in India. In early 2000, India requested Iran to loan a couple of Asiatic cheetahs so that the species could be reintroduced and revived. But Iran denied this request due to differences between the two countries. Reportedly, Iran had demanded a couple of Asiatic lions from India in exchange for Asiatic cheetahs. India had reportedly denied this request and as a result, the deal fell through. Then later, the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology that is based out of Hyderabad had requested Iran to permit the collection of live tissue samples so that the Asiatic cheetahs could be cloned and reintroduced in India. But this request was again turned down by Iran. Then from 2010 onwards, India pursued a deal with Namibia to import and introduce African cheetahs into the Indian subcontinent in the place of Asiatic cheetahs. So due to Iran's refusal to cooperate, the reintroduction plan was modified to introduce African cheetahs from Namibia on an experimental basis. After Namibia agreed to the deal, the Environment Ministry, the Wildlife Institute of India and the NTCA, along with environmental experts, tried to identify potential sites where the African cheetahs could be introduced. Studies have shown that 
the Kuno Palpur Wildlife Sanctuary in Madhya Pradesh is the best suited site for the experiment. Along with this, experts have suggested other suitable sites as well, and this includes the Nora Dehi Wildlife Sanctuary of Madhya Pradesh, the Shagad Landscape and Desert National Park of Rajasthan, the Bunny Grasslands located in the Kutch area of Gujarat, and the Satyamangalam Wildlife Sanctuary and Tiger Reserve in Tamil Nadu. But this experimental project ran into trouble in 2012 when a petition was filed at the Supreme Court on environmental grounds. Based on this petition, the Supreme Court decided to stall the project after identifying these concerns. The Supreme Court was concerned about the introduction of an alien species into an unnatural habitat. Because see, the Indian subcontinent is not the natural habitat of the African cheetah. So the Supreme Court was concerned about the feasibility of this project and it was concerned whether the African cheetahs would be able to acclimatize and adapt to Indian conditions. The Supreme Court was also concerned that the introduction of the African cheetah could bring it in conflict with other big predators such as lions, tigers and leopards due to insufficient prey base. After flagging these concerns, the Supreme Court had decided to stall the project in 2012, but now it has decided to give the approval for the project after being given assurances by the National Tiger Conservation Authority. While giving this approval, the Supreme Court has laid out a set of precautionary measures that have to be taken up by the Environment Ministry and the NTCA. As a part of these precautionary measures, the Supreme Court has constituted a three-member committee comprising of officials from the Wildlife Institute of India and the Environment Ministry and this three-member committee is supposed to guide the NTCA in the introduction of African cheetahs from Namibia. This committee has also been mandated by the Supreme Court to submit a progress report once in every four months and it has also been tasked to carry out an extensive survey so that the best possible habitat can be identified in order to facilitate the African cheetahs to acclimatize and adapt to Indian conditions. See, the advantages of this project is that it will not only help revive the cheetah species in India, but it will also help to restore the grassland ecosystems. This project will also bring global recognition for India if it succeeds in reviving the extinct species. And the reintroduction of cheetahs into the Indian habitat also has great potential for tourism. Now let's take up the next article. 10 more wetlands in India have been declared as Ramsar sites. See, conservation of wetlands has always been given very high importance because a wetland is considered as a critical ecosystem. See, even though wetland ecosystems have harsh environmental conditions, they are able to thrive because of the unique adaptations that are shown by the plants and animals in the wetland ecosystem. So as a result, wetlands are blessed with rich biodiversity. Apart from having a wide variety of fauna and flora, they also provide the following services. Wetland ecosystems can act as a natural filter and they can remove water pollutants and they can aid water purification. They also help in the recharge of the groundwater table and more importantly, they act as a natural barrier against floods, tsunamis and cyclones. Especially coastal wetlands which have mangrove forests, they are considered as a very effective barrier to mitigate the impact of tsunamis and cyclones. And due to their high rate of productivity, wetland ecosystems can act as a very effective carbon sink as well. They can absorb huge quantities of carbon dioxide and keep it away from the atmosphere and thus wetland ecosystems can play a key role in our fight against global warming. Then wetland ecosystems can also be seen as a key resource for local communities and the industry. They can provide food and livelihood opportunities for local communities and they act as a source for key ingredients for the industry, especially the medical industry and the cosmetic industry. So if these resources are exploited in a sustainable manner without damaging the wetland ecosystems, they can become a significant contributor to the economy. 
and due to the recreational potential of wetland ecosystems, they can be easily turned into popular tourist destinations as well. So considering the environmental and economic significance of wetlands, the global community came together to establish the Ramsar Convention or also known as the Convention on Wetlands in order to promote the conservation and sustainable usage of wetland ecosystems. This convention was signed in 1971 in Ramsar, which is a city in Iran. Under the Ramsar Convention, the Ramsar List or the List of Wetlands of International Importance is maintained in order to identify the critical wetland ecosystems of the world which deserve special focus as far as conservation efforts are concerned. These wetlands which are listed in the Ramsar List are known as Ramsar Sites and the Ramsar Convention promotes international cooperation amongst the members in the conservation of these Ramsar sites. It also encourages the member countries to share their best practices in conservation with each other and it also enables international funding for the conservation efforts of these Ramsar sites. So India being a part of the Ramsar convention had listed 27 wetland ecosystems on the Ramsar list. So until now there were 27 Ramsar sites in India. And yesterday, the Union Environment Minister has announced that 10 more wetlands have been placed on the Ramsar list and this takes the number of Ramsar sites in India to 37. First, let us take a look at the 27 Ramsar sites that existed in India. See, this map has been taken from the ENVIS database of the Environment Ministry. ENVIS stands for Environmental Information System and it is an online database that is maintained by the Environment Ministry. So the 27 Ramsar sites in India included the Ashtamudi Lake in Kerala, the Bitarkanika mangroves in Odisha, Boj wetlands in Madhya Pradesh, Chandratal wetland in Himachal Pradesh, Chilka Lake in Odisha, Dipor Beel in Assam, the East Kolkata wetlands in West Bengal, Hariki Lake in Punjab, Hokera wetland in Jammu and Kashmir, Kanjli Lake in Punjab, Kyoldyo Ghana National Park in Rajasthan, Koleru Lake in Andhra Pradesh, Loktak Lake in Manipur, Nal Sarovar Bird Sanctuary in Gujarat, Point Kalima in Tamil Nadu, Pong Dam Lake in Himachal Pradesh, the Renuka Wetland in Himachal Pradesh, Roper Lake of Punjab, Rudra Sagar Lake in Tripura, the Sambar Lake of Rajasthan, Sastam Kota Lake in Kerala, the Sundarban wetlands of West Bengal. This was recently designated in January 2019. Then the Surinsar Mansar lakes of Jammu and Kashmir. The So Mururi Lake, which is currently located in the Union Territory of Ladakh. The Vembanad Coal wetland of Kerala. The Upper Ganga River in UP. This Ramsar site includes the stretch between Bridge Ghat and Narora. And finally, we have the Vular Lake in Jammu and Kashmir. And yesterday, the government of India has announced that 10 more wetlands from India have been added to the list of wetlands of international importance under the Ramsar Convention. So this takes the total number of Ramsar sites in India to 37. Now let us talk about the 10 new Ramsar sites that have been designated. This includes Nandur Madameshwar Bird Sanctuary in Maharashtra. This is the first Ramsar site of Maharashtra. Then three Ramsar sites have been designated in Punjab. See, Punjab already had three Ramsar sites. Now three more have been added. This includes Keshopur Miyani Community Reserve, Beers Conservation Reserve and the Nangal Wildlife Sanctuary. And Uttar Pradesh until now had only one Ramsar site. Now six more have been added. This includes Nawab Ganj Bird Sanctuary, Parvati Agra Bird Sanctuary, Saman Bird Sanctuary, Samaspur Bird Sanctuary, Sandi Bird Sanctuary and the Sarsai Navar Lake. Now let's take up a small article from page number 9. Indian Navy launches Operation Vanilla to help Madagascar. See Operation Vanilla is the code name that has been given by the Indian Navy to the HADR assistance that it is offering to Madagascar. Recently Madagascar was hit by a severe cyclone which has caused heavy flooding and landslides in the country. 
Madagascar being a friendly African country in the strategic Indian Ocean region, the Indian Navy has immediately decided to help out Madagascar by providing humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. For this operation, the Indian Navy has deployed INS Airavat, which is a large amphibious ship which was already deployed in the region. And this naval ship has been diverted towards Madagascar to provide for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Now let us take up a column from page number 10. In this column, former National Security Advisor M.K. Narayanan evaluates the geopolitical and internal security risks for India in 2020. According to the writer, the year 2019 was an uncertain, volatile and turbulent year not just in India but around the world. The writer says that in 2019, we saw a deterioration in modern values such as democracy, democratic freedoms, globalization and liberalism and this decline in modern values was seen not only in India but around the world as well. To highlight this point, he refers to the example of the aggressive and unilateral policies that the US has been pursuing, especially against its arch rivals, Russia, China and Iran. He refers to the unilateral attempt of the US to dismantle the multilateral world order. He refers to the policy of sanctions against Russia. He refers to the policy of trade wars against China. He also refers to the hostile policy of the United States, which has increased tensions with Iran. And he attributes these developments to be one of the reasons behind uncertainty and volatility in 2019. He also refers to the uncertainty that Brexit has created across Europe and in the United Kingdom. He also refers to the uprisings that Latin American countries have seen over the last one year. He refers to the destabilization of Middle East due to ongoing civil wars in Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Egypt, etc. He also refers to the ongoing anti-government protests in Hong Kong and how these developments represent a decline in democracy, in democratic freedoms, globalization and liberalism. These global geopolitical developments represent a risk for India's foreign policy and national security. He also goes on to highlight the challenges to India's internal security that have emerged in 2019. He refers to the Pulwama terror attacks, the increased tensions with Pakistan following the Balakot airstrikes, the controversy surrounding the revocation of Article 370 and the current political climate in Jammu and Kashmir. He also refers to the controversial Citizenship Amendment Act and the massive protests that are going on across the country. And he also refers to the response of the government, such as clamping down on protests, shutting down the internet, etc. as undemocratic in nature. The writer says that these internal developments represent a risk for India's internal security. Now let us take up a column from page number 10, which provides for a critical evaluation of the recent restructuring of the railway board by the Union Cabinet. See, recently, the Union Cabinet has approved changes to the composition and functions of the railway board. As a part of these changes, the chairman of the railway board has been redesignated as the chairman plus the CEO. Through these reforms, the government has also tried to reduce the members of the railway board from 8 to 4. Along with this, the government is looking to rationalize the responsibilities of the members of the railway board on functional lines, that is, on the basis of their specialization. Another key reform is to bring in four members from outside the railway hierarchy in an advisory capacity in order to bring in fresh thoughts and ideas. Along with this, the government has also approved the upgrading of 27 posts of general managers to the rank of secretary to the government of India. The writer says that these reforms were very much needed in order to streamline railway management and he appreciates the changes that have brought in to the composition and functions of the railway board. But the writer is critical of one particular reform which deals with recruitment and card management. See, currently under the Indian Railways, there are multiple Group A central services that deal with administration, technical departments, 
security, etc. And the members of these services are currently recruited through the Civil Services Examination and the Indian Engineering Service Examination which is conducted by the UPSC. But now, the government has proposed to merge all the Group A Central Railway Services into a single cadre known as the Indian Railways Management Service or IRMS and this would exclude only the medical and the security departments. According to the government, recruitment for the new IRMS cadre will also be carried out by the UPSC but through a separate new examination. The justification provided by the government for this reform in personnel administration is that the current system of recruitment and cadre management promotes silo mentality amongst the officers and this results in inter-department rivalries. The argument of the government is that generalist officers who are dealing with administration do not understand the needs of the specialist officers who are dealing with technical departments. And this argument applies vice versa as well. The government believes that multiple central railway services is responsible for creating a narrow vision and a narrow mindset amongst the officers and their concerns are limited to their own departments without any consideration for the overall vision of the Indian railways. So according to the government, this narrow mindset or this silo mentality promotes interdepartmental rivalries and this results in jurisdictional conflicts or turf wars. So in order to address these concerns, the government has proposed to merge all the existing central railway services into a single cadre known as the Indian Railway Management Service and this would exclude only the medical and the security departments. And the UPSC will be conducting a separate competitive examination for recruiting officers into these eight organized services. But the writer is critical of this reform because according to him, this will kill specialization by seeking to merge administrative roles with technical roles which are essentially generalist and specialist in nature. He also says that the government has wrongly diagnosed the problem and the government has wrongly attributed a negative perception to silo mentality. According to the writer, silo mentality doesn't necessarily refer to a narrow mindset. This could also refer to greater specialization within each department. The writer says that such high degree of specialization and narrow-minded focus is needed, especially in the technical departments. And according to the writer, the existing interdepartmental rivalries is not an outcome of silo mentality. He says that interdepartmental rivalries are mostly situation-specific and incident-specific and it is usually reported during accidents and failures. After railway accidents, we have often seen that one department is trying to pin the blame on the other. In order to address this, what we need is personnel administration reforms at the top levels of the management in order to build greater coordination and cooperation amongst various departments. The writer says that by seeking to merge generalist and specialist branches under one single cadre, the government is going to commit a grave mistake. The writer also questions as to what would be the difference between the current recruitment under civil services examination and Indian engineering service examination and the new examination proposed for IRMS. Because both the exams will be conducted by UPSC at the end of the day. So the writer says that this proposal to create a single cadre for railway services and the proposal to change the recruitment system represents a case of wrong diagnosis and a case of bureaucratic overkill. Now let us take up the practice questions. Which of the following reasons primarily contributed to the extinction of Asiatic cheetahs in India? Was it hunting, habitat loss, assisting in royal hunts, climate change? We have already discussed this topic in detail. The correct answer is hunting and assisting in royal hunts. Various kings and emperors they not only used to hunt Asiatic cheetahs for sport, but they also used to hold them captive to be used as assistants in royal hunts. So both 1 and 3 are correct. Option C is the right answer. Now let us take up the second practice question. Which of the following statements are correct? 
the Montreal Record under the Ramsar Convention is a register of wetland sites on the list of wetlands of international importance where changes in ecological character have occurred or are occurring and are likely to occur as a result of technological developments, pollution or other human interference. It is maintained as a part of the Ramsar list. Currently, two Ramsar sites of India are listed in the Montreal record. This includes Kyoldyo National Park of Rajasthan and Loktak Lake of Manipur. Vembanad Lake in Kerala was placed in the Montreal record but was later removed from it. Amongst the given statements, the fourth statement is incorrect and the other three are correct. So option C is the right answer. See, Montreal record is a part of the Ramsar Convention. It is a part of the Ramsar list as well. The Montreal record basically tries to identify those Ramsar sites which are undergoing changes in their ecological character due to developments in technology, due to pollution and due to other sources of human interference. So out of the 37 Ramsar sites that we have today, two of them have been listed under the Montreal record of the Ramsar list as well. This includes the Kyoldyo National Park and the Loktak Lake. And the fourth statement is incorrect because it was not the Vembanad Lake which was placed on the Montreal record and later removed. Instead, it was the Chilka Lake of Odessa. Now let us take up the third practice question. The introduction of 5G technology is expected to revolutionize which of the following applications? Self-driven cars, Internet of Things, Smart Cities. See, 5G technology is expected to revolutionize the speed and bandwidth of internet connectivity and the volume of data that it can transfer. The introduction of this communication technology is expected to revolutionize data-driven applications such as self-driven cars, Internet of Things and smart cities. So option D is the correct answer. This question has been asked because we have a related article on page number 14. According to this article, the United Kingdom has permitted Huawei networks of China to play a limited role in the development of Britain's 5G communication network. This permission has been given by the UK despite facing significant pressure from the United States. Because the US has been consistently opposed to the entry of Huawei in the 5G network of the Western countries. Because the United States believes that Huawei represents a cybersecurity threat due to its close connections with the Chinese government and Chinese intelligence services. See, today, Huawei is the leading manufacturer of telecom networks and telecom infrastructure. And cybersecurity experts believe that Huawei is deliberately creating backdoors in its telecom networks, which would allow the Chinese government and its intelligence agencies to spy on desired targets. So due to this threat, the United States has been trying to exert pressure on its close allies and friends such as UK and as well as on India to keep Huawei out of the 5G network. Recently, if you remember, India has allowed Huawei to carry out field trials of 5G networks. And now, the United Kingdom has given approval to the involvement of Huawei in the development of Britain's 5G network. But this permission comes with a set of conditions the involvement of Huawei would be limited to 35% of Britain's 5G network and it will be kept away from all critical sensitive networks. But strategic and cybersecurity experts who are critical of the United States, they believe that the US has been doing this purely for economic and geopolitical reasons. According to them, the United States is concerned about the dominant position that Huawei has in the telecom world. If Huawei is given a role in the development of 5G networks around the world, then it represents a major loss for American companies. And it also places much of the data that would flow through these 5G networks under Chinese control, which would represent a geopolitical risk for the United States. Now let us take up a map-based question. Which of the following statements are correct? Namibia is a resource-rich African country which shares a coastline with the Indian Ocean. Namibia has huge reserves of uranium and India has signed a civil nuclear cooperation agreement for importing uranium. But Namibia's commitments to the Pelindaba Treaty has been a roadblock for exporting uranium to India. The first statement is incorrect. The second and the third statements are correct. 
So option D is the right answer. See, Namibia is an African country which is very rich in resources. But it does not share a coastline with the Indian Ocean. It shares a coastline with the Atlantic Ocean. Please look at this map. This is where Namibia is located. It shares a border with Angola, Zambia, Botswana and South Africa. And it shares a coastline towards the Atlantic Ocean. Namibia is a resource-rich country and it also has huge resources of uranium. So in order to import uranium from Namibia and secure its uranium supplies, India had already signed a civil nuclear cooperation agreement with Namibia. But this agreement has not taken off and Namibia is still not able to export uranium to India because of its commitments to the Pelindaba Treaty. See, the Pelindaba Treaty is a treaty amongst all the African nations and it establishes Africa as a nuclear weapons free zone. As a part of this commitment, African countries have pledged not to trade in nuclear technology and nuclear products with countries which have not signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And I hope you know that India is not a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty because it considers the Non-Proliferation Treaty to be discriminatory in nature. So due to Namibia's commitments under the Pelindaba Treaty, it is not able to export uranium to India even though both the countries have signed a civil nuclear cooperation agreement. Now let us take up a practice question from the 2015 prelims paper. With reference to dugong, a mammal found in India, which of the following statements are correct? It is a herbivorous marine animal. It is found along the entire coast of India. It is given legal protection under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. See, the dugong is also referred to as the sea cow. It is a herbivorous marine animal and it has been protected under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. But the dugong cannot be found along the entire coast of India. Instead, it is found in specific locations along India's coast. This includes the Gulf of Kutch, the Gulf of Manar and Park Strait and few areas of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So the second statement is incorrect and option C is the right answer. Finally, Let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, discuss the factors responsible for the extinction of Asiatic cheetahs in India. Is it feasible to reintroduce the species? The second question, the recent restructuring of the railway board is a case of bureaucratic overkill. Critically evaluate the statement. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post them in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.